All right, hello and welcome to the seventh ichthyology lecture. This one is about diseases. Uh, diseases are physical malformities, uh, physical issues within the fish. We're not talking about anything genetic. We're not talking about anything neurological, directly at least. Uh, this is just physically things that are changed. Some people have a definition of disease uh, that doesn't fit what diseases really mean. Some people think of diseases as things that can be transmitted or viruses or something like that. Diseases in general are just, you know, a physical deformity of some sort. So the first thing to talk about is the fish immune system uh, as how that's relevant to diseases. Uh, it has a lot of strengths and weaknesses. One weakness that the fish immune system has is that unlike other vertebrates, other higher vertebrates such as mammals, fish don't have bone marrow and they don't have lymph nodes, which are very important in the immune defense of higher vertebrates. Uh, but fish don't have that. But they do have organs within their body, you know, small organs that perform similar functions. Uh, one of these is the spleen. The spleen is the center of immune defense in fish. It is the main control area for all of the different uh, responses that a fish might have to a disease or parasite or virus or anything of that sort. Uh, so the first thing to talk about is chemicals and water quality, because nothing matters more to a fish's physical health than the health of the water that it lives in. In the same way that a human being kept in a room with toxic air is going to have issues surviving because the air that they breathe is toxic, fish are going to have trouble surviving with toxic water. Uh, you absolutely need to have clean water if you want a healthy fish. And some of the reasons for this, uh, first of all, ammonia. Ammonia is a common compound that's created when things decay, such as uh, you know defecation from fish or like plant decay in an aquarium or many things like that that decay, release ammonia. And ammonia is actually extremely toxic to fish, not because the chemical in general is specifically toxic, but because it's non-ionized. Uh, and basically what that means for a simple explanation of chemistry is that this compound has a balance charge. It has an even amount of negative energy and positive energy. So it's very balanced, whereas a lot of these compounds that you find in water are ionized, meaning that they don't have a even charge. They're either more positive than negative or more negative than positive. And when they're more positive than negative or more negative than positive, they're more likely to bind with something around them. They want to fix that. They want to be balanced. And so they'll bind with something nearby them. Uh, and that causes them to not be very good at getting through things because the moment that they try to get through skin or membrane or something like that, uh, they tend to just fall apart. So like ammonium, NH4 plus is an ionized it has lost an electron, so it has a positive charge. Uh, and because of that, it'll be looking to gain an electron to get a balance charge. Uh, and that causes it to be bad at passing through things. Uh, but ammonia is not ionized, so it passes through things incredibly easy. So it's very toxic specifically for that reason. Nitrate uh, is generally non-toxic when we talk about nitrates and nitrites. Uh, and then chlorine and chloramine, though you don't see them very often in natural water environments, are heavily toxic in basically any amount. So if you've ever thought of putting fish in a pool, definitely don't. Fish cannot take any amount of chlorine. Uh, and that goes for if you have a pool that's been, you know, a freshwater pool, which you had chlorine in for a while, a swimming pool for humans, and you drained it and then filled it with fresh water that you didn't put chlorine in, it would still be very toxic to fish because those trace amounts of chlorine left on, you know, the liner and anywhere around and say the steps and the ladder and all these places where trace amounts of chlorine are going to be left are going to still be toxic to the fish. So if you've ever seen that YouTube video where the people dra you know, drain the pool and then refilled it with regular water and then built like an, you know, an ecosystem of fish, those fish most likely all died very soon after. Uh, any trace amount of chlorine will be toxic to fish. So for general diagnosis, this is what you look at when you see a fish. And these are, you know, some ideas. This is not always true, obviously. This is just, if you see this issue in a fish, this is what you should be most concerned at or look into first. So if a fish is trapped in one spot of the tank, it's generally due to weakness of some sort. Something about them is making them unable to, to swim, to move. Seems pretty obvious. The current is controlling them rather than their own movement. If they're near the surface or they're breathing very heavy or fast, uh, it's usually due to a respiratory illness. Uh, if they're swimming poorly, it's usually due to a neurological issue. Uh, you know, something within the brain is not functioning. 
if they have orientation or positioning issues, if, you know, if they're upside down or on their side or something of that sort, it's usually a buoyancy disorder. Uh, because as we learned in previous lectures, fish are buoyant. They use their swim bladder uh, in order to keep themselves upright and balance themselves. Uh, if they're flashing or scraping, which is sort of like pushing themselves off the bottom like this, you can think of it as like itching themselves. Uh, that's usually due to external parasites. Not always, but usually due to external parasites. If their fins are clamped or closed against their body, that's a non-specific disease symptom. It's a very common symptom of diseases, but it doesn't point you towards any specific disease. It just tells you that there's likely a disease in play. And if it has a concave abdomen, if its stomach is, you know, pushed in or its eyes are sunken in, that's usually due to emaciation, uh, which is a form of, you know, malnutrition. The body is not getting what it's want, and so it's sort of thinning. You can think of it as over thinness. So first off, we have diseases of the eye. Uh, so we have endophthalmia and exophthalmia, uh, which is just a sunken in eye versus a bulging out eye. It makes sense. Exo, out, exit, endo, inside. Uh, then we have keratitis. Keratitis is when the tissue in the cornea of the eye becomes inflamed. Hyphema. Hyphema is when blood gets into the anterior eye. This is usually as a result of trauma, so getting hit or cut or something like that that allows the blood to pass its way into the eye. It usually doesn't just happen on its own, uh, but blood can get in the eye, and that's you'll usually see this redness in the eye here. Then we have hypopion. Hypopion is when white blood cells find their way into the anterior eye. This can also be uh, as a result of trauma, uh, or this can be as a result of uh, some kind of internal issue caused without trauma happening. Uh, just as a disclaimer, I couldn't find a good image on hypopion, so I made this image by taking an image of a normal fish. Um, this is not exactly what hypopion would look like, but because I couldn't find a good image, I just gave you a recreation that should hopefully give you the idea. It's just white blood cells in the anterior eye. And then we have gas bubble disease. Uh, this is somewhat common in aquaculture systems um, because in aquaculture systems, they're pumping in nitrogen into the water to try and make the water well balanced gas wise. Um, but if you pump in too much nitrogen uh, and there's a super saturation of nitrogen, which means there's more nitrogen floating in the water than can be binded to by the water, uh, it can get into the fish's system and it'll be shown in the eye and it, it looks gnarly. It's these, these bubbles that you'll find on the eye of the fish. Uh, cataracts, this is something humans get somewhat often. Uh, it can be caused by a, a variety of different things. Cataracts can. Um, some examples are nutrient deficiencies, ocular trauma, an infection can cause it, a parasite, osmotic shifts, or water toxicity. Uh, so if you do see a cataract, it can be a variety of things still. You can't quite uh, narrow it down. And if you're wondering, because I said that uh, I made this image about hypopion, the difference between hypopion and cataract, since they look very different, like a or very similar, like a cloudy eye, in hypopion, you're going to see, like, clusters it's not going to be a completely clear shield over the eye uh, because it is white blood cells uh, whereas a cataract is the eye itself clouding over so you're going to see like a clear layer over the eye that's how you can tell the difference so general diagnoses when it comes to gills diseases of the gills uh, so if you see pale gills it can be due to anemia uh, or it could be excess mucus on the gills can cause them to be pale and that can happen for a variety of reasons. If the gills are overly red, now keep in mind, gills are meant to be red. Um, gills contain gill lamellae, which have lots of blood in them, which then use, uh, you know, take oxygen from the water. Uh, so they're meant to be red. They have blood in them. But if they're overly red, like a dark, deep red beyond what you would expect from gills, can be due to hyperemia, the overexcess of blood, or inflammation causing that. And then if you have brownish gills, this is usually as a result of high nitrites, and it results in this thing called methemoglobinemia, which I think I said right, um, which is just the browning of the gills due to high nitrite levels in the water that they're breathing. Uh, then we have goiters on the gills. Um, you can see on this betta fish right here under the gill, you can see a little red fleshy mass popping out. That's called a goiter. It is thyroid tissue proliferating, so it is thyroid tissue growing too far, basically, uh, at the front of the opercular cavity, the entrance to the gills. Then we have spinal diseases. Uh, the three most common spinal diseases, or the way that they can be defined most easily, is scoliosis, lordosis, and kyphosis. 
Uh, so scoliosis refers to the horizontal bending of the spine. So if you look at the fish top down, you're going to see it bending. Um, lordosis refers to the spine caving downwards. So the belly coming out and the top caving in. All right. Uh, and then kyphosis is the opposite. The top caves up. So you can imagine kyphosis is like a hunchback. Um, lordosis is like your back is sort of built in a little bit. And scoliosis is just a totally different axis. You're dealing with this horizontal axis. Uh, then we get to skin diseases. Uh, we've got ulceration. It's very common. You'll find on fish, and it can happen for a variety of reasons. If you find an area of roughened skin, uh, it's usually due to superficial ulceration. And if scales are falling off too easily, it's usually due to ulceration under the skin. Uh, so usually something under the skin is ulcerated, and it's poking up. It's peaking up even if you can't directly tell, and that causes the scales to fall off really easy. So if you notice a fish losing a lot of scales from a certain place, there might be an ulcer under the skin there. And then we've got leopardothosis, which is also known as dropsy, and it is probably the most common symptom. It is not a disease in itself. It's just a symptom like coughing in humans, for example, or a headache. Uh, it's the most common symptom of some kind of disease in fish, and it is the pine, pine coning of scales. Uh, it's usually caused by slemic distension, which basically means slemic, meaning the belly or the body cavity, pushing itself outwards. So basically just, you know, a belly being pushed outwards causes the scales to pine cone. The scales don't pine cone on their own. They pine cone because the belly's pushing out or severe edema. And edema is when you have excess fluid in your tissues. It's extremely common in diseased fish. Uh, so it can be for a variety of reasons, and this is a lot of times people will post on aquarium subreddits and, uh, you know, ask people who know fish diseases and stuff like that to try and get a diagnosis on their fish when their fish looks like this, when their fish has dropsy. Uh, and the real answer is there's really no way to tell what's wrong with your fish just based on dropsy, because here's a list of the you know potential things that could happen that could result in dropsy i mean you've got slemic distension like we talked about which actually causes it it can be caused by bacterial infection viral infection fungal infection parasitic infection neoplasia which is when the cells are growing under uncontrolled growth polycystic kidney disease which happens in cyprinids and leucicids uh, obesity obesity egg retention uh, and it's also a common thing that you see in spawning females uh, when they are holding those eggs inside of them, it's actually common and not something necessarily to, to worry about. Uh, as far as the selenic cavity goes, uh, the selenic cavity can be concave. So, you know, when the selenic cavity comes out, uh, that's distension, and that's when we see things like dropsy. Um, but the selenic cavity can also go in the opposite direction. It can be concave and go inwards. Uh, and this is usually from emaciation, like we talked about earlier, which is a malnourished fish for one, or, one reason or another. And a malnourished fish does not mean that you are not feeding the fish enough, okay? Malnourishment just means that the nutrients from food are not getting to the fish's tissue, to the fish's cells. Uh, so it could be that they're not being fed enough. It could be that they're not being fed the right things. It could be that there's some kind of physical issue which is intercepting the nutrients from getting to their tissues. It can be caused by parasites eating up all the nutrients that the fish are eating up. There's a variety of reasons that emaciation can happen, but it's not directly necessarily related to how much you're feeding. People make that mistake where they see an emaciated fish and assume that they have to feed more. Uh, umocytes, umocytes or umocytes uh, are basically just fungal mold and water mold uh, that grow on the outside of the fish. They look sort of cottony. This fish has a really bad case of it. Uh, and they can be seen easier when the fish is submerged. If you pull the fish out of the water, you might notice that mold and stuff like that is a little less visible. It's more like clamped on. And when it's wet and underwater, it's much easier to see uh, these mold growths. And then we've got lymphocystis. Uh, lymphocystis is these pinpoint white growths on the surface of the skin. So they're not growing in, you know, large clusters or on a line. They're pinpoint. They're in specific spots. Uh, and they are not like ick. I wanted to make a point to point out ick because people see lymphocystis and confuse it with ick or see ick and confuse it with lymphocystis. Ick is the result of a parasite on the fish. Lymphocystis is a result of growths. And then finally, we have carp pox. Heart pox uh, is just a, you know, an example of a, a viral infection in carp. 
that results in proliferative growths on the skin. So the skin growing outwards in these sort of white or pink uh, benign plaques. Uh, benign meaning they're not cancerous. They're just these little white growths on the skin. And that is all for today uh, as far as diseases go. Next time we'll talk about parasites. Uh, a lot of these things with diseases and parasites go hand in hand. Parasites sort of cause these physical malformities a lot of the times. And so it's hard to separate them like this. Um, but I do think that they are distinct things. Diseases being physical malformities and parasites being an external thing affecting the fish. Uh, so I wanted to talk about those in a separate lecture. And that is what I will do next time. See you then.